Hello. Well, this talk's going to be a little bit different. We're focusing on historical events, specifically what happened about 70 years ago, 40 miles or so from here at Bletchley Park. The really rather remarkable mathematical and engineering achievements have been largely left out of the history books just due to the secrecy that surrounded the place. I'm going to look at the Colossus. Yeah. Um, it's the world's first programmable digital electronic computer, see what it did, why it did it, and how it was built. So some context, it's World War II. Radio communication has really taken off. So aeroplanes, infantry units, submarines, ships, all used radio to communicate. The German high command also had their own radio network. Um, often telegraph lines have been cut or destroyed during the war. So they needed to communicate with generals at the front. Um, all of this had to be encrypted. It could be intercepted in Britain. Uh, all the intercepts from the so-called Y stations, they were taken to Bletchley Park, where the government code and cipher schools had moved shortly before the war, mostly to avoid bombing in London. Also, it was well positioned. It was halfway between here and Oxford, on the West Coast Main Line into London. Um, they pretty consistently broke a lot of German codes and messages. That's the Enigma. Um, that so big, it's a portable machine, often used in the field. Um, if you'd seen um, the imitation game, that's that machine, and the bomb, primarily designed by Alan Turing, helped break it. It was initially broken by the Poles before the war started, and they passed on the secrets. I'm going to be talking mostly about the Lorenz machine. So that's what the German high command used to send much longer messages um, between generals. The British never actually saw this machine until almost at the end of the war, uh, but still managed to break their messages fairly consistently. So, I'll try and show you how this worked. It was a radio teletype machine. It used a 5-bit code for each character. It generated a 5-bit key. Um, it then XORed them, sent that over radio. And back, you XOR with the same 5-bit key, and the character comes out. It's a demo. So on the left, we've got what's called the chi wheels. On the right, these are the psi wheels. Um, there are five, so the bits at the top um, are the code, the key that will be used. So you XOR the top five of those, the top five of those. That produces a key, which is then XORed um, with the character. The chi wheels, the ones in red, turned on, uh, with every character. The psi wheels, uh, about half the time, when they turned exactly, it was determined by these two middle motor wheels. So hopefully this will work. So that's what we've got here. Um, we can type in the character. Obviously, all the bits along the top are zero at the moment, so it's not going to do anything to the character. We get A out, and you can see the key, the orange bit, is just null. It's all zeros. Now we have a 1 at the top, and if we type in A, the key will be 1, E, and we get a different letter out. So you can see how that carries on. Um, each of these 1s and zeros is a cam it represents. Um, they're settable. You can change them. Uh, sort of blend little switches on the actual wheels of the uh, Lorenz machine. And carry on typing in. The psi wheels on the right turned only um, when the uh, was it the rightmost motor wheel had a one in the first place, about half the time. You can also change the position of the wheels. So if that changes your output. Okay. Uh, okay. So yeah, they were dubbed Chi, Psi, and Mu for the motor wheels at Bletchley because they'd never seen the machine before. So just mathematical names. Um, the number of cams was actually co-prime, which just means the length until the key repeats itself is as long as possible. So we need some notation. <coughs> You've already seen chi and psi. Uh, P is for plain text. K is for key. Z will be the ciphertext. D is the pseudo plain text. Um, don't worry about that yet. I'll use this O plus for XOR. Note that in bitwise arithmetic, you can pretty much anything goes. So addition is effectively the same as um, subtraction. It's all modulo two. So you can 
move algebra around like that, and if you XOR something with itself, it's zero. Okay, so on to how we crack this. The first method generally applies to any stream cipher, um, a depth. So if two messages are sent with the same key, uh, you can XOR them together, the key part disappears, and then you get this formula. Um, if you can then guess just a bit of one of the plain texts, you can see what the other plain text would have to be. Um, if that's sensible, you carry on, you probably guessed right. So presume, as long as you can guess a bit of one, just knowing it's in German is probably enough, you can get the other plain text and there, therefore the entire key stream. So the first um, Lorenz message was found on, I believe, June 1941. In August, a couple of months later, it received this 4,000 character depth. Um, it's just an operator being lazy. It sent a message, it got garbled, and been received properly, so it descended again. Um, he didn't change the position of the wheels, um, so, but he shortened the message slightly, so he left out punctuation and shortened words. A man called John Tiltman took this message, recovered both the plain texts, and therefore the key stream. It was built up, the Cambridge graduate, uh, reconstructed the machine mathematically. So he was the one that named the chi and psi. Like this, so if you like the characteristic equation, z, the ciphertext, that's chi, x over psi, sort of the plain text. Otherwise, you can split it up into two parts. You can just say the pseudo plain text is the ciphertext with the chi component removed, which is the same as the plain text with the psi component added. Um, and you can split up the decipherment. So that's exactly what was done. You had two sections, the Newmanry, um, led by Max Newman, another Cambridge graduate, and a fellow as well. Um, they focused on removing the chi component. <coughs> so their output was just, uh, it looked random. It would still had the psi component in it. Um, this was statistical methods because you don't have any reasonable output. This is where Colossus was. That's what I'm gonna be focusing on. There was also the testery led by Ralph Tester. Um, you had to have a good knowledge of German because you'd get German plain text and that's how you worked out what the psi component was. Also useful to kind of know the habits of the different operators um, and how they work. So yeah, we'll focus on the numeracy. Um, you have to find first the CAM settings. They were generally changed monthly. It's a bit of a pain to go through every single little switch. The wheel position is much easier to change. They're changed for every message, or supposed to be. Um, so we're mostly going to assume we have the camp settings. Colossus was actually used to find them later on, uh, but initially they just worked from depths. And the main problem was finding <coughs> the G settings for each message. So a bit of maths, I'm afraid. Um, we'll define diffing. You take one character and the next character and you XOR them together. Um, if those two characters were the same, and you XOR them, you'll get zero. And it distributes over, a dist over XOR quite nicely. Um, we're gonna use this. So this is useful because the psi wheels didn't always change. Um, so if the psi component was the same twice in a row, you XOR it, it would disappear. And then the psi component disappears from the diffed equation and actually the diff pseudo plain text becomes the same as the diff plain text. We just have the G component in it. Um, so we can carry on with this, and this kind of gives us a way into working out just what the G component is on its own without having to, having to worry too much about Psi. Um, so Bill Tutt, he also invented what's known as the one-two break-in. Um, if you just look at the first two bits, of each character, it turned out they were usually the same. So they usually XOR to zero. Um, and if you diff two characters that have this property, the diff uh, plain text will also have this property. And because the diff <coughs> pseudo plain text is the same half the time, um, it also has this property, though to a slightly lesser extent. So this gives us a way of getting the first two bits, provided we can do all this computation. computation. Um, we plug in this formula, so uh, we diff the ciphertext and our guessed G position. We worked out the pseudo plain text. 
diffed, and we expect it to be zero more often than it's not. And this does actually work. We generally have quite long messages, so we only need a little bit above 50% to get a pretty good certainty that we've guessed the right position. We can actually completely characterize uh, delta D, the diffed pseudo plain text. So you can see here, um, some of the characters occur far more often than others. <coughs> and this gives us a way in. This table is actually taken from an American report. Everything at Bletchley Park pretty much was burnt or destroyed after the war. Um, the Americans didn't destroy all of theirs, so this was taken from the National Archives in America. Um, it's actually named the Special Fish Report. So the British called the Lorenz machine Tunny. I've seen it before. And Teletype printers were generally codenamed as fish. Oh, yeah, mention dots are zero and x's are ones. That was just notation used at the time. I'm not entirely sure why. So we can think of lots of different things we can do from that table, lots of different Boolean functions we might be able to work out that would give us a deviation from half the time being true. You look at dots one, two, break in, turns out about 53% of the time, the first two characters, first two bits, sorry, are the same. I've listed a few more here. Um, don't worry too much, it's just these could be implemented on Colossus, so this is kind of why it could work. <coughs> well, they had a problem at the time. Um, look at this, the messages were quite long. The G wheels had quite a long rotating period, even just the first two. Look at all the combinations of positions. Um, we ended up doing about 10 million XORs just to do one message. And they didn't have computers, so that's an issue. They took inspiration from the bomb machine, made an electromechanical device, some analog circuits, that implemented TUTS 1, 2, break in. So it took two tapes, the ciphertext, punch tape, um, and Qi patterns. So if you already knew the cams, you'd put them into a punch tape and you'd feed this into the machine. Um, and this sped things up pretty dramatically. Uh, it could have been better, but it did give a big speed up. Uh, so what were the problems with it? Um, it? Well, the first time they turned it on, it actually caught fire. And this is kind of something of a recurring theme. But the main problem was with the two uh, tape readers. They often got out of sync. So they were running at about 1,000 characters a second. Um, which is pretty fast for just paper. Um, and you didn't have to get out of sync by very much, and it would completely ruin all your results. Um, it's named Heath Robinson. The women from the Royal Naval Service were mostly operating the machine. Um, it's named after a cartoonist. So, Colossus. It was designed mostly by one man, uh, Tommy Flowers. He was an engineer. Um, he thought he could make a better machine that was purely electronic, um, could run much faster. A lot of people at Bletchley Park didn't believe him, thought it would be too unreliable, which had never been done before, and valves were somewhat known to be unreliable. Um, so these were his ideas. He'd generate the qi stream, key stream electronically um, rather than having it fed in as a tape so it should allow it to run faster. So we wanted to make it more programmable so it can do more than just dots one, two, break in. So him and some engineers who supported him at the post office labs, so it was in Dollis Hill, um, started construction on the machine. So there were a few issues they had to overcome. Uh, if you want to diff characters, you need the previous character that was used. Um, so you need a delayed signal, that's from storage. You don't want to replicate all the creation logic. Um, and there was a pretty tight time scale. So in, in, in the end, it was completed in 10 months, which is pretty fast, considering ENIAC took a few years um, and delivered to Bletchley Park. So that's um, a replica of the machine at TNMOC. So it's the National Museum of Computing. That's actually in Bletchley Park. Um, it's pretty big. On. So this is what it printed out. So it had a printer as its output. Um, look here, it would go through all the positions of a wheel, and it would print out a count of 
the number of times some Boolean function was true, so maybe tuts one, two, break in. Um, if that count was above some certain preset value, the A is just like a counter ID. Um, this is quite a boring run. It's only doing one wheel. You could step two different wheels and do all the possible combinations of positions at once. You'd actually do more than that, but you couldn't step through combinations of all of them because it would take too long. So this is a schematic diagram, I guess, of the uh, Colossus Mark I. So you had the tape reader pattern generation. You generate the diffed um, chi and Z. Uh, and then the logic units could decide Program them up to decide whether to use the um, diff versions or just the plain versions. You do some function, you count the number of times it was true, you print it out. So, Colossus Mark II, delivered about six months later, it actually added shift registers. Um, it had five logic units and five counters, they all ran in parallel, so it's effectively a five times speed up. This one had about 2,400 valves in it. The first Mark I had about 1,600. It was programmed by a pretty big array of switches. Um, so the tape reader. G-Stream generated electronically. You only needed one tape. This solved all the synchronization problems that Heath Robinson had. Allowed it to run much faster, much more reliably. Um, and ran at 5,000 characters a second. So that means the uh, paper tape was going about 50 miles an hour. So this is really quite fast. Um, the sprocket that turned the tape actually generated the clock pulses that were used by the rest of the machine. So this is what we had. We didn't have any transistors or anything yet. It's 1944, maybe. Um, so we're using vacuum tubes. The one on the left, uh, it acts something like a diode. You have a heated cathode. Electrons are emitted from that. Um, provided there's a voltage at the anode, it only allows current in one direction. If you add in a grid, it acts something like an amplifier. So depending on the um, voltage on the grid, it defines the amount of current that can pass through the valve. So you can build logic gates with this, in a similar way to transistors. It's an end gate, actually using a pentode valve, so that adds three layers of grids. Um, when that, uh, it's four. Uh, an AND gate or an XOR gate. So imagine how the functions were implemented just with lots of valves. They also had thyrotrons. So instead of vacuum inside, they had um, an inert gas, maybe xenon. Uh, it had an anode, a cathode, and a sparking grid. Um, if you spark the grid while well, there was a voltage across it, you actually get plasma going between the anode and cathode, and that allowed it to carry a current. Um, you could then turn the grid on and off as much as you liked, and it would keep that current going. Um, so this means it acted as a one-bit store. If you wanted to quench it, it was called yet to drag the anode uh, below the voltage of the cathode, uh, and that would turn it off. So these were used in a ring, um, and this generated the chi wheel pattern. So it was like a one-hot, so you sparked one of them, and that sparked the next quenched itself, spot the next and quenched itself. Um, and you could wire these up with the cam settings you had. Um, and that allowed you to generate the patterns. These ran pretty fast. It was 5,000 times a second. It's the clock speed, basically. So we needed a one cycle delay to generate our diff values. We actually used an integrated capacitor circuit. Um, so you can kind of imagine if you uh, have V in high, it's going to take a while to charge the capacitor before V out goes high. And say V in is low, it's going to take a while to discharge the capacitor. If you attach a valve acting as an amplifier, much like a transistor on the end, you can get effectively a one cycle delay if you choose R and C carefully enough. So this was how the diffing worked. You do an delay, you'd get to do the XOR, and that gave you the diff value. <coughs> Again, the logic units could choose between, between using one or the other the diff or plane values. So the Mark II also added shift registers. This was completely new. It had never been done before. Um, so we invented shift registers, I guess. Uh, length up to five, it allowed 
the functions on the last five characters or the last five diffed characters. Um, we can actually zoom in on this and you can see this was a um, diagram that's kept legally by one of the engineers and recovered when doing the rebuild project. Um, you can see the integrated capacitor circuit, resistor, capacitor attached to ground and a pendoid valve. That's like a clocked amplifier, so it's only high if the clock pulse is also high. Okay. So there were five programmable logic units on the Mark II. Um, they all run in parallel, programmed by switches on the front. So I'm trying to explain it. You had uh, five switches to select bits from our pseudo plain text, and five switches to, to select ones or zeros to compare them with. If you wanted to do XORs, you had switches to XOR different bits together. So if you're going to do TUTS 1, 2, break in, you flick the first two sum switches to XOR the first two bits. You'd set the compare bits to zero, and you'd put it maybe at the counter one. Um, if you put two things into the same counter, they both had to be true um, for it to register. So it acted like an AND, and there was a negation switch for each um, operation. As you can negate values, so you can build up different um, logical functions, basically. And it ran pretty fast at the time. It was 200 microseconds per um, clock cycle. The counters, this was actually based on a pre-war design. So it was Charles Wynne Williams. Um, he worked on circuits at the Cavendish in Cambridge, which under the supervision of Ernest Rutherford. Uh, it's PhD, um, looking at counting alpha particles. Um, so he designed electronic counters for that. Uh, the ones on clusters were actually faster than the designs for the alpha particles. He was brought to actually Park by Max Newman, who'd heard of his work. Um, so you had to divide by two with a thyrotron ring. So you had a ring of two thyrotrons, one spark able to quench when they'd switch on each count. You can then feed this into a ring of five. It was actually pentode valves, and these that allows you to count up to 10 in total. Four of these together, and you can count up to 10,000 very quickly. Um, yeah, so each one had a counter and would print. You could set the value at the start of the run. Um, you just use statistics to work out how many was the, like the likely output and have them higher than that, and they'd all be printed out. And then at the end of the run, you go through, and you'd see if any were much higher than the rest, and you could work out what the chance it was that that one was the correct one, the correct position of the chi wheels. So it's an example run. So if we use TUTS 1, 2, break in, uh, we set up a machine like that to compare the first two bits. We can, if we're lucky, uh, message is reasonably nice. We can work out what the first two chi wheel positions will be. Then we can run several uh, different tests in parallel, maybe on the next run. And again, with a bit of luck, we can find all three of the other um, chi wheels. So we'll have all five wheels. Uh, each run is about half an hour if you're doing two um, wheels, testing through two wheels. So this is breaking it in maybe two hours to break a message, um, provided it was fairly well behaved. Uh, this is quite a big improvement. Heath Robinson would take about a day, or half a day per message. So they worked. There were 10,000 colossi, no, sorry, 10,000 people working at Bletchley Park. There were 10 colossi, uh, two more ordered uh, on the way, and they were breaking pretty much every message. Um, so this is after halfway through 1944, kind of D-Day time. Um, so why did it work so well? Well, it was a pretty general machine. It could do far more, certainly, than it was originally required. It could do far more than TUTS 1, 2, break in. It could actually be adapted. You could work out the different cams on the chi wheels using it, run with just um, one of the cam set, effectively. Uh, you could, it helped work out the psi positions as well as the psi cams later on. Uh, it started changing the cams more often towards the end of the war and its speed was unprecedented at the time. To give you some idea, about 15 years ago, um, a Java applet uh, to simulate the Colossus was made, um, and the original Colossus actually ran faster than on the hardware at the time. So this is, it's a Java applet in IE5, but still, it's quite impressive how fast it was. Uh, so it'd be good to talk about the influence it had on the computing industry, but it's quite hard to do 
30 years is a long time um, in computing. Certainly, Turing worked on the Pilot Ace computer. That was the fastest in the world uh, when it was built. Flowers worked on modernizing the uh, telephone exchanges using electronics um, and dot the cell. The Flowers was working, it was actually where the Pilot Ace was built. So it's hard to give a, a concrete answer, but you can certainly say it had an unseen, certainly an impact on British computer science. Well, okay, that's it. I hope I've given you some appreciation for quite remarkable history of British code breaking um, and some knowledge about the first digital computer. Thank you.